Hello. Hey, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Maggie Henry. I'm the interim coordinator of the Institute of Highland Studies here in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island in Canada. I'll mostly be behind the scenes today, but I do have a few quick things to go through before we get started. Um, so I see a, a bunch of you have popped your cameras on, um, not directly targeting you. I was going to say this anyway. Um, so to make this virtual experience run as smoothly as possible, we actually ask that you turn your camera and your microphone off. Um, that'll just help us um, save bandwidth so that we'll hopefully have a smooth presentation. Um, we also recommend that you set the view to speaker mode rather than the gallery view grid so that you'll have the best viewing experience with the speakers. Uh, we'll let you know that this event is being recorded for our YouTube channel as only the speakers will be on camera um, because we'll all have your cameras off. Um, this won't really affect you as audience members, but if you're not comfortable with this, please feel free to leave now and you can watch the recording when it's up on YouTube. By staying, you are indicating your consent to be part of this recording. If you haven't already, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. It's fun to see who's here and where folks are joining us from. Um, I know we've got people from all over here today, so it's really great to have you all here. There will be an opportunity for questions in our second half, so please go ahead and submit your questions at any time in the chat and we'll come back to them later on. You can send them in the main chat or you can send them to me directly if you prefer or to Richard. Um, by changing the two at the bottom of the chat field and, and clicking on my name or on Richard's name. So on to the main event. Now that we've got all of that covered, um, we've got a wonderful session in store for you this evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Ebiguet in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. As we're gathering today on a virtual platform, it's important to respectfully acknowledge the history spirituality, culture, and rights of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from coast to coast to coast who have called this land home since time immemorial and who continue to experience the ongoing effects of colonialism and systemic racism. I encourage everyone to consider how we can each in our own way actively honor and uphold our treaty obligations in a spirit of true reconciliation. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Institute of Island Studies, we're a research, education, and public policy institute based at the University of Prince Edward Island. You can learn more about what we do by checking out our website, islandstudies.com, or our social media accounts, which I'll pop into the chat in a moment. Uh, the Institute of Island Studies has been hosting the Island Lecture Series in a few different formats for almost three decades now. We're excited to be able to offer our, our events in a virtual platform this year, because it means that you can join us from all over the world or just down the road from the comfort and safety of your own homes. At this point, we usually send our newsletter sign up sheet around the room, but things are a bit different now that we've gone virtual. So if you'd like to sign up for our monthly newsletter, I'll pop the link for that in the chat in a moment as well. With that, I'd like to introduce our host today, Dr. Richard Lem. Richard teaches creative writing and literature at the University of Prince Edward Island. He's a poet, has published a number of poetry books, and is currently waiting for the Blue Jays to call him up. In the meantime, hey, the Jay's loss is our gain, and we're very happy to have him here this evening to lead what I'm sure will be a really interesting conversation. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Maggie. And a warm, warm welcome to everyone in our audience. It's great to see so many people here from, from the island and from other parts of Canada. Welcome. There may even be people from beyond uh, south of the 49th parallel or beyond our ocean shores. Our format for this evening is after I introduce our honored guests, um, e each of them will read two poems, and then I have a couple lead-off questions for Lori and Bren, and then which are dealing specifically with their new books, and then uh, I have some more general questions, one each for Lori and Bren, then we will open the floor for questions from the audience, from you folks, and then come back to Lori and Bren, who will read one more poem each, and then we'll finish with a, a few fun questions for uh, our honored writers this evening. So will Lori and Bren please come on stage? A Hi, everyone. Applause, applause for Lori and Bren. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> nice Lori to Bren, see you all. Lori Brinklow is the interim coordinator of MA Studies in the Island Studies program. She's the author of one book of poetry before this one called Here for the Music. And I'm keeping these uh, intros very, very short 
so that we can move on to the poetry and the conversation. Uh, Bren Simmers is a managing editor, the managing editor of Island Studies Press at UPI. She is the author of two poetry books before the new one, Night Gears and Hastings Sunrise. She's also the author of a very new memoir called Pivot Point, which is also nature writing because it's a memoir about a wilderness trip. And the other thing, uh, one thing I'll mention that I think most, if not all of you know, is that the three of us uh, left the beautiful West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, to come to PEI, as Lori Winkle likes to say, Islanders by choice. So all three of us are from British Columbia. And so uh, we have that in common. So on with the show. Bren is going to read first, and then we'll go to Lori. Bren. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. It's such a pleasure uh, to get to celebrate these new books and to see all your names up um, on the screen. It's, uh, it's a real honor. Um, I'm going to start by reading uh, two poems from my brand new book. Uh, it's called If When, and it, it's so new. I just got a copy of it last week, and I'm just going to dive in uh, with the opening poem. It's called Accident Lion's Bay. Tell yourself a happy story, driving S-curves in hydroplaning rain. No one wants big feelings at a party. Step back, experience your emotions as a wave. Repeat, you are not your emojis. Heart eyes and banana grin say the opposite of what you mean. Put on your public face, your outfit armor, and prepare for the evening ahead. Oh, busy fall, blur really, no, no. A great fall, lots of hiking. Your rehearsal cut short when traffic halts, a line of cars that sirens part. One by one, idling engines turn off. Sedans glow blue, incoming texts whistle, accident in Lions Bay, car flipped into oncoming traffic. Moments ago, you were absorbed in the wall you built to keep others out. And now this physical closure, both lanes, north and south. Firefighters' reflective coats direct traffic. Their advice, head back to Squamish, alive. It comes down to that. You're not in an ambulance speeding towards emergency, all the wet way home. Your brake lights tell a different story. I, I remember that high rate very, very well. It was scary. For those who aren't aware of it, it's, it's the one that takes you to Whistler. That's what people, most people are aware of. Oh, wonderful poem, Bren. Thank you. They um, they did sort of uh, sort out that highway a bit for the uh, 2010 Olympics, but there's still a real sort of uh, a curvy section um, that uh, that it is quite quite dangerous. Um, so I'm going to read a, a second poem, um, and that sort of brings us into um, sort of the Squamish that I moved to uh, in 2013. And it was a really interesting time to be there because it was undergoing a, a really large shift from sort of um, a a logging town to a tourist outdoor mecca sort of town. And there's a lot of conversations going, going on at that time about what the future should look like for this place. And um, so in this poem, you'll hear the voices of different people uh, that I interacted with in Squamish. Um, and uh, on the page, the poem has actually lots of different columns that represent those different voices in conversation. And it's called, My Squamish is Not Your Squamish. I grew up with wood fiber and the log sort, he says, not this goat loving mare wearing gumboots. Everything comes from the forest, she says, holding two cones in a wrinkled hand. Clean air, water, medicine, the food we eat, the houses we live in all paid for by lumber. Don't get me wrong, I contributed to her campaign. Do you know she plays ukulele? Lots of opposition to the ski resort, says the reporter. Land grab, depleted aquifers, but people won't go on record. Logging trucks chugging down Cleveland past the bike shops. It will always be a timber town, he says. 
wood cheap enough to burn. Chop your own tree at Christmas. Sure, I say, I won't lose my job by speaking out. Before wood fiber shut, this was a one income town, family with all the toys. Blue collar, white collar, pink collar, green collar, she says, quads, bikes, trucks. We need to find a way to talk to one another. In Paradise Valley, they say, neighbors on the dirt road know each other by what car they drive, what color their driveways are during election time. So I'll pass, pass the baton over to, over to Lori. Richard, we can't hear you right now. Oh, while you're passing the baton, we have someone in the audience who's in Iran at 2.30 in the morning. Welcome, thank you for being here. <laughs> Lori. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Bren. I am so looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of your book. Um, it's uh, just arrived, as you said, and so uh, looking forward to getting down to the bookmark and getting one. Um, Thank you, Maggie, for organizing this. Richard, for um, being here, being our amazing host. We have uh, go back a long, long way to the 1980s when I first arrived on Prince Edward Island. So he's been around and seen me through all of my various careers and, and uh, supporting me on my writing journey. And I'm so appreciative of him continuing to do that. Um, this, I'll tell you a little bit more about the book in a moment when we um, get into that part of our conversation, but I'll just start with two poems, um, one from, uh, that I, was, I wrote for a Newfoundlander and one that I wrote for a Tasmanian, and I'll tell you about why that is in a minute, but first of all, here are the poems. This one's for Doug House, and Doug is a sociologist who um, taught at Memorial University for many years. He's an author and he was a public servant. So he wasn't the usual type of person that I interviewed when I was interviewing writers and artists and musicians, but I really thought that the idea behind this poem fits with the one from Tasmania. And so I just wanted to share. So it's called Just Because You Come From an Island for Doug House. Growing up, you never thought that much about the island, about being a Newfoundlander. But off to school in Montreal and Toronto and later teaching in Calgary, you'd hear the jibes, silly jokes about me, our people. You tell me the story of a party where somebody says, oh, I heard this great Newfie joke. Then he looks at me and he says, you don't mind, do you, Doug? I say, yes, I really do mind. The room goes quiet. You could hear a pin drop. Then somebody changes the subject. You tell me the story of your colleague who asked you to do a guest lecture about Newfoundland. You say, yeah, sure. Hmm. Then you realize just because you come from a place doesn't mean you know it. You read up enough to bluff your way through. You tell me the story of coming back for a job teaching Newfoundland culture on educational TV, traveling the island, interviewing Joey Smallwood, Richard Cashin. You become steeped in it, loyal to it, know that if you're going to make a contribution, you want it to be here. Be part of Newfoundland's own quiet revolution where people like Cabot Martin and Brian Peckford started questioning the 60s aspirations to get an A&W or a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise to catch up to mainland Canada or the rest of the world. You say, it was like we had given up on Newfoundland his identity that thoughtless headlong rush into modernism by which you do what other people do. You tell me a story about your father growing up in the 1920s, 30s, when Newfoundland was a country, how when he said heading to the West Coast, he meant Cornerbrook. You say, just because, I, just because I came from Newfoundland didn't mean I was a Newfoundlander. It only happened when I came back. 
And I'm going to pair it with a poem for Danielle Wood. Um, and Danielle is from Tasmania. She teaches at the University of Tasmania and is a novelist. And um, she writes uh, her, her book, um, The Alphabet of Light and Dark was the one that I read when I was doing my uh, research when I was in Tasmania. Uh, um, and she also writes under other pen names. So she was here a few, several years ago now at UPEI doing a writer in residence as part of the PEI Tasmania Writers Exchange that was going on. And I know that a couple of people in the audience here tonight have been there to Tasmania as part of this exchange, including Richard. And um, so they know all about Tasmania, the beauty of it. Anyway, this poem for Danielle is called Part of the Conversation. As a child, you were the magpie, picking up the shiny bits of family lore and hoarding them against the day you would need them. With, should I stay or should I go? pounding in your head, you left to write your novel in the corrugated, uh, corrugated iron shed in Broome in the far north of Western Australia. Miserably homesick, unbearably hot, you cooled yourself with stories of home where you could walk the streets with your mother and uncles who'd known everyone since they were children, who was married to who and who was not married to who anymore. You say, soaked in this big community memory with the idea that what you do will never go away. Not many things happen that many people are outside of. When the bridge fell down, everybody knew somebody who was either on the bridge or got stuck in traffic. But you could not bear being out of earshot. That home was going on without you. Tasmania, the place where mountain and water make sense, where the light falls differently, and where you can be the kind of person who sees the difference. You say, I like knowing what my patch is. I like knowing I can walk that far, and if I go any farther, I'll be off the edge. This is the patch on which I can play out my life, be part of the conversation, whatever it is. Even when you left, you were always coming home. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, now, I've heard, I don't think we uh, said what the titles of your books are. So start with Bren, title of your book. The title is If, When. And Lori? Mine is My Island's the House I Sleep In at Night. And you, you, one of you mentioned the bookmark. So lest I you know, forget it at the end of the hour, we always usually have the when we're having launches in person, if it's not an Island Studies launch, the bookmark is there selling books. So uh, again, thank you to the bookmark, to Lori and Don and Marlene for everything. And please support our independent bookstore uh, downtown. So the first question, Alistair McLeod, whom many of you know, some of you studied with, could say what each of his stories was about in one word. It's quite remarkable. He, for instance, he said in his last reading and talk here, he said, the boat is about loss. So I want you to tell us what your books are about, but you get 25 words. Bren. <laughs> are you going to keep counting? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, one word I would say legacy, 25 words I would say that if when is a cross-generational dialogue that's set in House Sound BC and it speaks to the struggle to find that balance between economic development and land stewardship over the last century. Lovely. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and they have written that down ahead of time. <laughs> oh. Um, Lori. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not take it quite that seriously. My bad, did not do my homework. Um, <laughs> if I could use one word, it would be islandness. Um, that's uh, kind of uh, obvious that the, it seems to be that's what I'm getting at in, in the whole project that I undertook to write the book. Um, but it's about all of those 
things that make island living special and it's looking or it's it's hearing about those things through people who are engaging in that sense of islandness all the time whether it's the artists or the writers musicians and they're from newfoundland and tasmania which is such a sharp sharp contrast because they're so far away yet they are so similar so and the themes come out in the shared traits of islandness that are in the book and that's probably way more than 25 i'm sorry <laughs> well as as People would say to me, oh, it's obvious that you're, you're a professor, Richard. So <laughs> on and on and on. So uh, that was great, Laurie, thank you. Um, a bit of a longer question. So Laurie and Bren, your books are substantially different in origin, focus, and structure. Laurie, you had the predetermined subject matter of specific writers, visual artists, and musicians from Newfoundland, Tasmania, and a bit of PEI. Um, so I'm asking the, sort of the full question of you and then Bren too. So Laurie, what were the advantages and the challenges of knowing your subject matter in advance? So we'll leave it at that and then go to Bren afterwards. What were the advantages sure. and challenges? The blessings and curses. Well, <laughs> for me, it, it started and, and I've, I've mentioned this before, if, if um, anybody's has listened uh, or heard me speak about my PhD research that I started in 2010 when I went to Tasmania. And um, it began with looking at trying to uncover those traits of islandness that um, because I'm just so interested in my own journey as an islander coming to Prince Edward Island from the West Coast, wondering how on earth, why I was so attached to PEI and what was that instantaneous recognition that I felt when I came to the island enough for me to say, this is home. And so doing the PhD journey where I was doing all of these interviews, I would be speaking with one of my participants and I would say, oh, that that sounds like a poem. And I would just go back and I would write this poem. It would pop out. And it kept happening over and over again. And so it became a pattern. And um, it was a pattern that I welcomed um, because it was um, dependable. And I have, I have probably another 25, I think I interviewed 40 people between the two islands. And um, I still have, um, I think there's 23 or 24 poems in this book. I still have another probably um, close to 20 interviews that I could go and plumb for more insights. And um, if I had time, you know, like a year off or something from work, uh, that maybe I could continue the project and start, keep writing these poems because it was such a beautiful, um, boxed in, it, you know, it fit my personality to have that reliability of a project to work on. And I didn't have to say, like I was getting my inspiration from the people and from what they said. And I didn't, um, yeah, in some ways I was maybe a little lazy um, <laughs> as a writer. You, you're looking all the time to see um, what can I write about next? But this was in front of me. I knew what I was going to write next. So for me, this was such a fortunate happenstance. Uh, um, I'm so grateful that uh, the serendipity happened that I was able to do this. And then they became part of my dissertation. And I found out that that was a totally legitimate way to write a dissertation, to have use poetry as part of a way to represent your research. And so double bonus, poetry and a dissertation. <laughs> That's me. So for all of you people out there who are going to do a PhD, ask to be able to include poetry, if you want. Good plan. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. So, and Bren, um, I was assuming that you had less foreknowledge than Lori did of your material, your subject matter, and that you experienced more surprises while you were writing. So, and the nature of your book, and those themes that you briefly described that they revealed themselves to you as you wrote. If that's the case, what are the pleasures and pains of a process where you're discovering what your book's about as you write it? Well, this book was really unusual for me because um, I started working on, on two projects simultaneously. I was writing these poems about living in Squamish and working in an environmental uh, education center. And so I was writing these sort of poems about 
about uh, nature and about um, you know ecosystems uh, and my experiences in the present day. And right around that time, my dad told me about um, my great grandparents and my grandmother who um, lived and worked in Britannia mines down the road. And you know how parents tell you stories of you know your ancestors and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you're living like just 12 kilometers down the road from where all these stories happen, they start to, to really kind of sink into you in a different way. And um, I started to research that time period of 1912 to uh, 1921, what happened in the mine. And there was just so many, um, so many sort of accidents, tragedies, fires, floods, avalanches, things that were happening during that time that I just couldn't help it. I started writing poems um, in the voices of, of my um, great grandparents and my grandmother. And, and then, so I'm, you know, plodding along. It takes me a long time to work on a, a project. And um, somewhere around 2017, I realized that the two were actually talking to each other. And I took the two manuscripts and I interwove them together. And uh, so the, the pleasure was the surprise. The pleasure was, I, I had no idea that was gonna happen, that, that I could sort of structure a book that way. Um, and, and the pain <laughs> would be the probably, well, it's sort of a pleasure and a pain, would be the two years of looking at the structure and figuring out uh, the balance between those two stories and where, where I needed more of one and where I needed more of another and, and sort of pulling out and honing that into, into sort of a, a more narrow focus. Um, so I, I love structure and I love kind of tinkering and rearranging. So I guess it's more of a pleasure than a pain, but. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to, before I ask my next questions, I see that Malcolm Murray has asked a really great one. And it is, this is for both of you, says Malcolm, what makes a poem a poem as opposed to some other bit of writing? Mm. <laughs> for me, a poem is something that you can wrap your head and your heart around and it makes you feel something. And um, there's writings, other kinds of writing that does that too. You know, you can read a 400 page novel and um, you can wrap your head around it and it makes you feel something, but there's just something wonderful about a poem that you can just kind of, kind of hold. And it, it's small and generally small and it's got very, um, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Isn't that ironic? Um, the, the kinds of words that you that have have more meaning than than just their obvious meaning. That they can take on nuances and and you can um, um, play with them and. Um, it ends up having a musicality to it, a rhythm to it. And um, I mean, all of that can happen in, in novels and plays and, and other, sometimes even emails, but <laughs> there's just something, something really special about that little concrete, or that little compact um, um, shape of a poem that just you can hold and treasure. I'm not sure what to add, <laughs> but uh, the same? <laughs> poems, uh, they have a musicality to them. They have a, a, a heightened attention to language. Um, I, I did a prompt, uh, this is National Poetry Month, and one of the prompts um, I did a couple of years ago was to write about uh, your favorite place, write about it and uh, in a paragraph form, and then go and take out all the unnecessary words. So. Um, no, no word, like every word is working hard um, to get that meaning or that feeling across. Um, and it, I think of it as sort of a, a compression, a compression of, of language, a compression of emotion, a compression of image. Um, time works differently in, in poetry than it does elsewhere. Mm, beautiful. It's a distillation. It, it intensifies vacation and almost uh, it fits really well with what I think sometimes of islandness and why people live on islands because life on an island can be distilled and especially a small one um, that's you know away from everything where you can actually go inwards and so poetry is that same thing you know it has that as, as Malcolm says nice compressed answer saying so Malcolm. <laughs> hmm. Great question. Well, that, that's a great question. Uh, uh, suggest other people 
uh, who want to ask questions, type them in and I'll keep my eyes on there. So this is um, one more question each from the two of you and then we'll definitely look at the chat room for other questions from the audience. So Bren, uh, the writing and reading of poetry enjoyed a heyday of popularity in the 1950s through the 1970s, both on its own and associated with many songwriters who had prominent roots in poetry. Then poetry's popularity waned in favor of novels and memoirs, and the newer songwriters, with few exceptions, were detached from poetry. Uh, I can't imagine, you know, the, the Coldplay group, you know, reading poets, uh, even though Peter Townsend of The Who still does. So many poets, or entirely, many of the poets from the 80s on abandoned poetry largely or entirely in favor of fiction, creative nonfiction, script writing. You two, however, are among those writers who remain devoted to poetry. So Bren, you wanted to talk about this question. Why do you remain devoted to poetry? Well, sorry, this is Lori. This, this is, is my question. question, come on. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I was my born in the 1970s. Um. <laughs> I can read my typing, but not my handwriting. So, Lori. <laughs> That's great. So, why do people remain committed to writing poetry when all of those other forms are out there? And I think it has a lot to do with the previous question, in, in that you feel something, it makes you feel something and people want to be able to express themselves in a way that makes other people feel something. Um, sure, some poetry comes out of a catharsis. It comes out of an experience that we might have that um, we need to write it out of us to get it to come to some kind of healing. But then in the next iteration of it, you try and take it to an art form. And so it becomes bigger than what you um, intended it to, or how you started out. And it becomes a gift to the world that is concise, it is um, carrying meaning. But it's just um, for me to write, it's a way of sorting out my thoughts. And I think that poetry is a beautiful way of doing that. And as, as Bren said, you know, you can pare things down to their essentials. And in our world, I think right now, especially right now, this past year, this idea of trying to, we have been put back to the essentials in our lives. And so poetry seems to be a lovely way of mirroring that. And um, it's a way of connecting um, to something, you know, I think so many people in the world feel disconnected and this was before covid that there's something going on you know you need to come to a, to be connected to something important and if that's coming from inside poetry seems to be a wonderful way of expressing that uh, connection and making other people feel that connection too that's not to say that i don't want to write songs and i will write songs <laughs> and maybe a novel <laughs> splendid laurie and and that the last part segues right into the next question, which is for Bren. So it's a commonplace to say that people are inundated as never before in a tsunami of words. You know, social media, uh, mainstream, et cetera, et cetera. Few of those words are poetry, relatively few. Yet amazing poetry continues to be written, published, and spoken. I'm of the strong opinion that people now as much as ever, perhaps more, should read poetry. And I assume that you agree, Ben. So why should people make poetry an important part of their days and their lives? Well, my cheeky answer would be because it's short. <laughs> and you can sneak it in while you're eating your cereal in the morning or keep a poetry book in your bathroom. Just saying. Um, but <laughs> aside from that, um, I think uh, poetry, uh, reading poetry fills you up. It gives you, um, it, it, it gives you a gift. And I, I think, you know, if you ask, it's, it's like asking musicians, like, why do you tune your instruments? You know, if you're a writer, you read to tune your instrument. So I think there's a lot of writers here. And I know for myself that when I'm 
um, when I'm not reading, there's not a lot to take out of my body into the into the poems. But when I'm filling myself up with words and images and language, and I'm I'm sort of in that that place of language, it's easier to express myself when I'm writing because that's the, that language is more accessible to me. Um, if you're not a writer, I think one of the reasons uh, I would suggest reading poetry is because it it asks you to slow down. It asks you to just take a minute and sit with this little shape on the page um, to, um, to pay attention. It's like the poet is saying, look at this and, and look at this and look at this and look inside yourself. And um, I think that's, that's really important to, uh, to try and make sense of the world right now. Uh, I mean, the, and, the, and the various complex emotions uh, that we're all experiencing right now in the world and poetry can help us um, make sense of it. And it, it offers us a, a place and a moment to slow down to do that. I wish, I wish maybe this is being recorded because I'd love to play that for my classes, <laughs> uh, literature and creative writing classes. Speaking of which, uh, I'll just add that uh, 15 to 20 years ago, poets were few and far between in UPI's creative writing classes. We have 12 students per class, maybe one or two would be writing poetry. For the last 10 to 12 years, it's been at least half of every class are either writing poetry exclusively or as seriously too, they're writing, moving back and forth between poetry and other forms. So it's, you know, these are the 18 to 25 year olds and it's really exciting. And there's some, some, of, some of the best poets to come out of PI right now are in that age group and they're, um, they're out there writing. And one of them, Heather Clark has a question and then we'll go to Sean Reeves question. So Heather um, says a question for Bryn. I noticed in the first poem that in a few places you you use some commands or signals such as put on your I do this too in my poetry where it seems like a do this or do that vibe do you include these commands for the audience or the speaker to follow well I think the the use of the imperative um, is is a great tool in poetry and uh, sometimes I think I use it as uh, talking to myself. Um, I'll be honest, a lot of poems that I, I write in the world are poems that I need and that I want to see in the world. And so sometimes that imperative is talking to myself. Um, sometimes it's uh, maybe the, you know, maybe it's in the speaker who's talking. Um, I, I, I think when, um, I, I don't offer it as a direction to to the reader because there's a fine line with you know with using imperatives because you know people don't want to be told what to do <laughs> so but it's but I also I like I like using that like removing the um, the pronoun removing the I and just starting with the verb because I I think sometimes um, it allows more people entry into the poem because there isn't a pronoun that they may or may not identify with or think includes them. Um, so that's why I think I use that sometimes as well. Great question, thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Richard. I always forget, thank you. Another question reminds me of a famous quotation by Theodore Rethke who spent most of his career in my hometown of Seattle. And uh, he's, he commented on free verse. Free verse is like playing tennis without a net. Rethke was a tennis coach before that and Rhodes Scholar played tennis. So poet Sean Weeb, who's also one of PEI's finest tennis players, asks of both of you, what kind of things are you paying attention to when you revise? Um, when I revise, I pay attention to, is this the right word? Could I find a better word that would uh, have more nuance to it, more bring more meanings, be more subtle, um, be more evocative? I also pay attention to the rhythm of the sentence, of the line. I want it to be musical. I'm a musician and I, I love um, reading and I want it to not have a... Um, any um, false steps or false beats or anything like that in it. Although sometimes you put one in just to, you know, for mix things up a little bit, but at least it's intentional. And um, also 
I think just making sure that it works in a way that will convey some kind of aha moment for the reader. If it conveys an aha moment for me, then I think, I hope it will do the same for the reader. Yeah, you want to have that sense of um, that sense of surprise. Earlier, Laurie, you, you mentioned about how sometimes writing can kind of help you um, sort of express yourself, but then you want to make it larger. It has to live outside of you. Um, and I think that's something that I often am thinking about. Um, is this just me whining or is this actually useful to somebody else? And what need, what do I need to shift to make this um, something that um, will that someone else will relate to um so that that removing it from from so being it so close there's something that happens in that um offering it out and uh and i also paid a lot of attention to uh sound so i read read poems out loud when i'm editing them and i also look uh at beginnings and endings because i find that sometimes um, I know myself, sometimes I can overstate an ending and I need, I need, I look at that last couple lines. I'm like, okay, am I, am I overstating it or does it actually end up here? And same with the, with the beginnings, where does it begin? You know, does the poem, where does the poem start to surprise me? And can I begin the poem there? So those are some things that I'm thinking about when I'm revising poems. Um, but it takes me a long, a long, long time. I, I go through many, many revisions. Or sometimes it can take me years to, to revise a poem. Um, particularly if it's personal, because I need the space from, from the event or the emotion or, or so that I can understand it from a larger perspective, so I can make it uh, more universal for the reader. Great. Thank you, Bren. Uh, my stepson, who was a UPI English Critter Writing Theater student, uh, gave me a Christmas present of uh, scotch glasses, whiskey glasses. And they all, each has a Hemingway quote about writing. And one of them says, uh, write drunk, rewrite sober. So, um, <laughs> That's so, good. I like it. <laughs> so, uh, one to note, uh, ask, uh, say, we do have time for another couple of questions if people want to get their typing fingers going and typing them down. So meanwhile, Sean had another question, which was, have you ever turned any of your poems into another form? I'm assuming he means like literary form and not culinary or. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have tried uh, t turning a, a poem into a song. It didn't work very well. Um, <laughs> so I would like to try it again sometime, but um, we'll see. And um, I've taken some of my poems and written them no, I've taken um, the other way, I suppose, taken memoir and written that into a poem. Although, yeah, I have taken it the other way too. I, I took one of my old poems and then tried to make it into a bit of a short story. Again, it didn't work very well. I think for me, um, where I've tried to uh, sort of turn poetry into another form was unintentional and that was with my last book pivot point where i wrote it as a long poem because that's what i knew how to do and then you know it, it sort of uh, very indignantly looked at me and it was like i am not a poem <laughs> i am a memoir <laughs> so that that was unintentional <laughs> That's good. I also have taken an email and written that into a poem. It started out as a rant and it then, oh, this has another life. <laughs> so um, the last call for questions from any of you out there. Well, um, I'll, I'll ask a couple of fun questions and maybe some, a uh, few other people will type things in. So. Bren and Lori, if you could travel anywhere in the world with any author, living or dead, as a tour guide, which author would you choose and where would you travel? I would travel to Greece with Lawrence Durrell. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> he is the original, I think he might be the coiner of the word Ilomania. <laughs> and so I would love to see Greece through his Ilomaniac eyes. 
Vegas. For those who don't know Lawrence Durrell, wonderful travel writer and an extremely popular novelist. He had a tetralogy, four novels called the Alexandria Quartet, set in Alexandria, Egypt in the 1930s, which is one of my favorite, favorite books. So, so you wouldn't want to go with Gerald Durrell, his brother, traveling uh, farm to farm. Didn't he write the books about the animals? Well, so, I think uh, it was Bren, who would you travel with and where? Uh, well, I have to admit, when people ask me off the cuff questions, my mind goes completely blank. <laughs> That's just something that happens. Um, but uh, the answer that popped into my mind was because I'm looking over at my bookshelf and I see Don Mackay's all new animal acts. And I'm a big fan of Don Mackay's work. And I think he's a lovely human. So I would just like to drive around in like a, a VW bus around Newfoundland with Don Mackay. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> Is it all the national parks, all the parks, you know, all the little coves? Okay. Okay, a couple more quick, quick questions, and then we're going to ask you to each read one more poem to wrap up the evening. So quick, quick answers for these. This is a summer Olympics year. If you could be an Olympic athlete, what sport? Badminton. <laughs> Badminton, okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's an actual sport, but I'd be an excellent badminton Olympian. Okay. Lori. I'm sorry, but my internet is so bad that I missed that whole question. The question is, if, if you could be an Olympic athlete, what yes. sport? Oh, um, swimming, because I love being in the water. Okay. Um, here's a poet's question. If you had to choose, would you rather be an astronaut or a deep sea diver? Oh, even though I love the water, I think I'd rather be an astronaut. <laughs> yeah, mm. me too. Okay. And one final quick question, quick answer, and then one more poem each. What would you like to come back as in your next life? Um, a poet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't do that. Oh. Something you aren't now, nor a publisher. Okay, a cat. <laughs> okay. I'd like to come back as a heron. Mm. Nice. Great blue, night or little blue? <laughs> I would go for great blue myself, um, although all herons are good. <laughs> okay. So I think we're, you did ask the question of your favorite poet. So one poet, quick, and then we're gonna read some poems. This was from Peggy Walt. Your favorite poet right now. Right now, uh, if Lorna, not all Lorna yeah. Crozier. Uh, for me, it would be Victoria Chang. Her book, Obit, is phenomenal. Okay. Well, right now, for uh, 50 of us, our favorite poets are Bren and Lori. <laughs> so, favorite poets, please read one more poem. Who would like to go first? Well, I'll go first because okay. Bren already mentioned him. And I had, see, Bren, I had actually put a post-it note beside my poem for Don Mackay. And so um, he was one of the Newfoundlanders that I interviewed, actually interviewed him here on Prince Edward Island when he was here because I kept missing him in Newfoundland. Um, other people included in the book that I wrote poems for, Michael Crummy, Lisa Moore, Wayne Johnston. And um, it was just an incredible experience. And I have to thank each and every one of them, people that um, I interviewed who shared time with me, um, shared their words and their passions with me. Um, other, this book would not have existed without them. So I um, humbly, humbly thank them. So Don Mackay, as many of you know, is now living in St. John's. And I noticed somebody had written a, um, a question in the chat about um, interviewing people who weren't native islanders. And that's a dangerous thing in island studies to talk about who's a native islander, because am I always going to be a come from away? Well, I feel like I'm an islander, even though I wasn't born here. But um, uh, John Mackay isn't, wasn't a Newfoundland, isn't a Newfoundlander originally either, but uh, he chose Newfoundland. And uh, so his uh, book, um, he's written, um, Strike Slip was his book that won the Griffin Poetry Prize, and he's won the Governor General's Award for Poetry twice for a couple of his books. So this um, comes, and my poem is called Rock Shift, um, similar to how he had um, Strike Slip. So Rock 
shift. And it starts with, and it's for Dhammakai, starts with a, um, an epigraph or a quote actually from um, Newfoundland and Labrador, the Traveler's Guide to the Geology. And it says, the oldest continental rocks in Newfoundland and Labrador are three, three 0.800 million years old, but the oldest rocks in the ocean are only 150 million years old. So that tells you how old Newfoundland and Labrador is. So here's this poem for Dawn. When you plug in deep time, everything becomes more complicated. A member of the clan come from away, you say you don't want to be anything else. On Newfoundland, everything is from away. Even the rock that comes from Gondwana, Avalonia, Laurentia, all jammed together to make this isle stuck out in the Labrador current. You say, other places we know were where they are, but here, you say, we are all new. The traces in the rock remind us, even the light trapped in the Labradorite comes from away. So you fit right in. You say, just the first baby step back and that erases us. Oil workers, miners, sealers, sailors, soldiers, fishermen, Beatak, who did not have to die. Perception shifts when you first come to this island. All the communities seem so close together. The longer you live here, the farther apart. You say, Hank Williams, Dr. H. Williams, the geologist, used to call it the holy ground of plate tectonics. And after the ocean has worn the rock away, even the shadow of our bones will be gone. And that's for Don Mackay. Wow, 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 wow. Grant. That was a really great, um, a great pairing and we didn't know what we were going to read but this next one sort of um it fits in well with this with what you just read um and as i mentioned there's some historical poems throughout this book and um, this one is set in 1921 and it's called eight days underground we heard the timber give way loose muck pouring down the rays we pressed against the beams as rock jammed below and beside us. When the roaring stopped, we dared look. Rubble sealed us in. Three timbers held the chamber from coming down on our heads, the nightmare. This is it. Francis and I looked at each other, the ever-present whistle gone from his chapped lips. A morning like all the rest, up goddamn early, had I kissed my wife and kids before I left? A drip made itself known and with it a task. We scooped a hollow for water to collect so later we could drink. The waiting entered every pore. I could hear my cells think. We knew they would try to dig us out. Hours passed, the spent hiss of my carbide lamp. Darkness, darkness like you've never. No stars, no shadows. We slept when we could, talked when we couldn't. What we would do or undo whose faces we held tight to, reckoning, I guess. We drank some water from the ground. Our stomachs hurt so bad. We tried chewing bark from the beams into a bitter paste. We spit out, calling Francis, Francis, every now and then to make sure he was still alive. Days passed, you hear that? Thud of pickaxes, we let out a holler but no response. Think these beams will hold? In the darkness, I drift, drifted as if at sea, saw myself as an old man, as a boy, before I was born, floating in that first ocean. A voice in my head, this is it. And then shouts from the other side of the rock. Francis let out a whoop, answered by pickaxes steady clang a sliver of light through the rubble, found, reborn. Powerful. Yeah, wow, Powerful. thank you, Bren. <laughs> yeah, 
I say Greg, Greg Doran, theater director extraordinaire is in the audience and uh, think, thinking what a dramatic monologue that poem would make. Speaking of from one form to another, mm -hmm. whew. Well, I'm going to, to say a few short final words and then for the uh, people in the audience, please stay with us. Maggie's going to come back on just to close the, the hour very quickly. So first of all, uh, thank you to the Institute of Island Studies and thank you to uh, our audience particularly, especially. Um, wonderful to have you here. I wish we could all be in person. Uh, maybe that will happen in the future, except it's going to, isn't it? Because I think there's going to be a live uh, book launch. So Maggie's going to tell us about that, I believe, uh, on May the 15th. Um, and faces are coming back in too. This is cool. Um, so thank you, audience, for being here. Um, Lori's favorite drink is Lefroy single malt whiskey. I'm not sure. I didn't ask what Brenz is. And that's single malt is mine too. So I thought, you know, uh, an occasion like this, would all of you please raise whatever water bottles or tea jugs or uh, Kamchuka juices or whatever you have and a toast to Lori and Bren, their new books. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so over to you, Maggie. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much, Richard, Bren, Lori, for being here um, and sharing your magic with us. Um, I haven't really dabbled in poetry at all. So this was a whole new experience for me. And it was really just, I'm obviously now gonna go buy and everybody, buy everybody's books. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Um, and you know, we're, we're getting used to this screen thing. You know, even though we're gathering through a screen, it still feels like we're hanging out together uh, in a way. So um, I'm glad that we're, we make do. Um, thank you. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to the audience uh, for sharing part of your day with us and for your really wonderful questions. Um, and it's just been such a treat to hang out here with all of you tonight. Um, as Richard mentioned, uh, yes, for those of you in Charlottetown who are comfortable getting out and about, um, Lori and Bren will be launching their new books in person on May 15th um, at the Beaconsfield Carriage House in Charlottetown with musical guests. Um, there'll be two shows, one at 3 p.m. and one at 7. Pre-registration is required, so if you'd like to attend, please email um, ispstaff at upei.ca to reserve your spot. I've just popped it in the chat, just if you scroll back up above all of the thank yous there, um, you'll find the information and a link to the Facebook event. Um, so with that, if you've enjoyed the session, please be sure to connect with us on social media, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, do whatever medias you do to keep in touch and stay in the loop about future events from us, as well as from our friends and colleagues in our Global Island Network. I'm just gonna pop some links in the chat here now. One moment while I try to multitask. Here we go. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the session is being recorded for our YouTube channel. So keep an eye on our social media uh, for the link in the coming days. And if there's someone who you think would have loved to have been here today, please be sure to let them know and send them the video when it's up. Thank you again, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay healthy, and we'll meet again soon. <laughs>